Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At Barnabas Health, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners on public television. Getting the best return on your college investment next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. New Jersey Resources. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. The Mental Health Association in New Jersey. The Russell Berry Foundation. NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Politicker NJ. Welcome to Caucus. I'm Steve Adubato. Is college for everyone? Every student and their family is looking for the assurance that a college experience will provide a solid foundation for a future successful life in business. Um, here to discuss the smartest decision that you can make for college, we have in the studio Michael Klein, CEO of the New Jersey Association of State Colleges and Universities. Gretchen Orsini, Associate Vice President of High School and Community Outreach at Berkeley College. Michelle Sikirka, President and Chief Executive Officer of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And Michael Labou is, is in his first semester at Berkeley College. I want to thank all of you for joining us. You'll see several websites up throughout this program that will be providing valuable information about college and affordability and also the best return on investment. Uh, Michelle, let me turn to you. You've been with us many times talking about business issues. Yes. But this is, is it a higher ed issue? Is it an economic issue, business issue, or all of them? Oh, it's a combination of all of them, Steve, absolutely. Um, think about workforce development and think about we still today do things in a very traditional manner. Uh, being a parent, what did I say to my kids all their young years? You got to go to college, you got to go to college, you got to go to college. Being where I am now and seeing all the array of opportunities available to students. Not everyone's cut out for the four-year education. You got two-year, you got career preparation, you've got certification programs, you've got trades, um, mm. skilled trade opportunities. There's a lot out there and folks need to really stop and think about what is the right thing for them. You know, interesting, by the way, real quick, uh, we don't plug a lot here, but this publication, New Jersey Business, your publication, yes. when I went through it recently, many of the articles are about higher education. Many of the articles are about higher ed institutions and what they are doing to partner with business organizations and vice versa. Yeah, let me is that a, a trend that's happening more and more? Uh, it is, and let me put some, some numbers behind what Michelle had to say. Um, there are 62% uh, of our jobs in 2010 in New Jersey uh, required post-secondary education. Uh, you can't get by with just a high school diploma. So to answer your question, um, uh, the college might not be for everyone, but uh, this is a valuable discussion because uh, students and parents should think about what to do after high school because by the year 2020, 68% of the jobs in New Jersey are going to require some kind of post-secondary training. And that's really important. We're at 62. We need to get to 68. So let's talk about this. The right fit. How, how do you help families, students? Because we'll talk about you in a minute. You didn't find your way to Berkeley the first shot around, it was the second time yes. for you. How do you help families, students, figure out what the right fit is? I think this is just another step in most families in their parenting. It's knowing your child. Um, we've all said we have multiple children. Um, every child is different. And it's more about finding out what they're passionate about, what is going to be something that they're really, truly interested in. When you talk to students, maybe your average student in high school, um, where their grades dip on their transcript, maybe the classes that they really didn't enjoy. You find a kid that says, I was great in math, but I hated science. Well, now we need to look into what careers can you do and what education do you need to participate in those careers that are going to concentrate on your strength and allow you to grow as that person? 
Um, that's why Berkeley has a very strong commitment. We have different levels of education. We have different entrance and exit points for students. To your point before, uh, we have certificate programs. What does we, that mean, a certificate program? Certificate programs are taught at a college level. However, they feed the need of an industry um, such example. as medical assisting. Yeah. Medical assistants are very prominent in the medical field or an intricate part of yeah. the medical community. Um, what do you need to become a medical assistant? Well, we make sure that our students have the ability by being KHEP approved. What does that mean? KHEP is a program, it's the... You need certain <coughs> approval clearly to enter that field. It's, yes. Here's the thing, I, I, the area that I wanna focus on. Every student or every young person has his or her passion or they haven't figured out what it is. And it seems to me that, and again, we have four kids, ages, believe it or not, 23, all the way to five, and they're so different in so many ways. Um, and I will tell you, with our son Stephen from my first marriage, I had an idea as to where I wanted him to go to school. And it wasn't his idea as to where he wanted to go to school. And let's just say we had a spirited discussion <laughs> about where he was gonna go to school and he won out. And the irony was that the school I wanted him to go to, he was offered a very significant scholarship and he turned it down to go to the school he wanted to go to. It wound up being the best decision he ever could have made for him. Somehow he sensed it and I wasn't listening to him and that's a mistake we make. Now for you, you did what after high school because you wound up transferring after that how did you prepare to make a decision about how to go to school? Not everyone is as prepared as everyone else. Well, I was speaking a lot with my parents about where they thought I should go. Where they thought? Yes. And then I started thinking about where I wanted to go and what I wanted to study. So at first I wanted to study the marine biology program. So I was looking towards Florida, California. And Let me ask you this. Did Florida or California have any appeal to you because of the weather? Not really. I okay. like being in the cold and the spring, okay. and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I looked towards Florida and California and I got accepted to one school in Florida. So the school, I went down, I looked at it, I liked it, but it was smaller than most schools, but not the smallest school I can be in. And I went there, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go here, I'll try and get through it. But I didn't really think that I really wanted to be there. So when I went there and they told me that I didn't make it into the program, that was kind of my excuse not to go down and to stay here and try and figure out what I actually wanted to do. So I started speaking with family friends hmm. that are in the accounting industry. And I really had an interest for numbers. So I decided to look into that. And so you switched majors? Yes. And was it friends? You were talking about friends? Family friends. Family and friends who gave you information about Berkeley and that's how you wind up? Yes. It, it's interesting, Michelle. How do you think most students make the decision, A, and B, do you think it's the student? In our case, it was our son. It wasn't, we didn't do it, he did it. Do you think the parents or the kid or both or what? Well, I have to say, and maybe this is a generational issue, but um, we as parents tend to influence our children a lot or direct them, perhaps. I don't know if we're good at influencing them, but we do direct them. Um, and it's a very difficult thing. I think parents tend to want to lead their children on the path. Um, that is a very generational issue. But I'll tell you a very similar story because my daughter came to me in the end and she was between two colleges. And she said, Mom, which one do I go to? And I said, She asked you directly? She asked me. Oh, boy. And I said, absolutely not. I will not make that decision for you. You'll make it and you will own it. And if it's the wrong one, after a year, you'll decide to transfer and you'll do whatever you need to do. But I needed her to own that Why decision. Why did you do that? Because I wanted her to own that decision. Because if that didn't go right, if I said to her, go to B school, and she went to B school, and B school wasn't working out, she'd say, well, you told me to go there. So I wanted her to own it in the end. 
That's interesting. You know, a, a it's lot of pretty this evolved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. I think a lot of this has to do with, the, and it, it's great the way that Michelle handled that. You want the student and the parent to have as most the best information as possible, and that's something. Where we are need. they getting it? Well, that's exactly yes. what I wanted to talk about and, and see what the group thought. Uh, that we we as a group of institutions through my association try to describe do the best. who's in your association. Uh, it, it's uh, the state colleges and universities. Uh, six of them are the old state teachers colleges. And uh, then the, uh, the institutions created in the late 60s and 70s. Imagine a time when New Jersey could create uh, brand new institutions like Ramapo, Stockton, Thomas Edison, uh, along with Montclair State, the College of New Jersey, Kane, uh, New Jersey City University, William Patterson. And if I forget one, I'll get okay. fired. But um, not the big R. But, but yeah, so just through, through a weird, uh, just how we were created, Rutgers, and New Jersey Institute of Technology, and now Rowan are not part of our association. They're the research institutions. Got it. But we, we work very collaborative, collaboratively together, and um, we all, this idea of uh, consumer information, getting... Yeah, where do you get it? Uh, our, uh, our website, the institution's websites, the, the government is trying to play a role now, the federal government and the state of New Jersey. There are the Secretary of Higher Education in New Jersey has got a good website that has links to everybody. Uh, each of the institution's websites. Yeah, but hold on. What about the fact that there are a whole bunch of people who are looking at lists? Right. They're looking at lists. Is this institution on the best business school list, the best this school list? Is, are there any New Jersey schools on the top 100, the top 200, the top 500, whatever it is? And it's, I, don't, I don't know who these people are making these decisions. I don't know what value there is you know, to those lists. And I don't know how to compare that to what is best for my child. And what about that? That's why I really believe that it's very important for both children and families to go down and visit whatever school they're looking right, into. Right. Now and what are they looking for when they get there? Is, is it physically what it looks themselves. like? They're looking at themselves. No, they're looking at themselves. They'll get a feeling when they go to a school. They will be able to assess the classrooms, can they visualize themselves sitting in those classrooms? Mm. Do they feel comfortable? Um, do they like what they see? Do they like the interaction that they see between the students and the professors? Um, Actually sit in a class and what You're saying mm -hmm. don't just look at the physical campus. No. Go into a classroom. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you need to know everyone learns in a learning environment in a different way. I can be perfectly happy sitting in myself, sitting in a class. I have to have my questions answered immediately. I have very low patience. So I need to be able to say, excuse me, over here, I'm not understanding. How about there's a 200 person lecture hall, you're not getting it. I'm not getting that attention. Now, for <clears throat> some students, that's perfectly fine and they can function that way. But for the student who can't, my answer is don't put yourself into that situation because whichever classroom you're in, whether it's a large class or a small class, you need that information to get the skill set that you're going to use in your career. So you need that information. However way you get it is up to you. And you can't get it all online, Michelle? Well, there's a lot of resources online. I mean, there's a lot of resources online. But the whole idea of, of word of mouth, um, you know, when you're looking at, at schools, talk to people who went there, find other students, have your kid talk to other Does kids who've been there. Absolutely. Because, you know, they'll share their personal experience. That matters. Sure. Let's talk about money, the economics of this, because we're talking about return on investment. And, and, and you deal with return on investment all yes. the time with the businesses that are members of the Businesses Industry Association. But Michael, how, how do you deal with that question of return on investment? How would you define a return on your investment of the tuition that it costs to go to college? I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, Is it, do I get a job in this much time? How much does the job pay me? I mean, it, how, how, do you, how do you measure that? For me, it's more of getting a job right out of college. Um, and Berkeley does help with that because they help Hold you on, down. Mark. Berkeley helps with getting, getting a job, like placement. We have a yeah. we have a, a career services department that works with our students in helping them uh, prepare for interviews, prepare the resume, putting together how to do a job search. So, Mark, how do you uh, respectfully? How do you even know? Because sometimes there are students who don't even know that services exist. How did you even know that that existed? Uh, when I went on my first tour for Berkeley. I asked a lot of questions with my admissions counselor just to make sure that it was for me. You did that? Yes. And now that you know that, 
you know that they're internships. Are you out there on any yet? No. Because you're only in your first semester. Yes. Your game plan is to do what moving forward in terms of internships? For me, I want to try and work in a smaller business just so that I can get used to the industry. And then I'll look into Berkeley and seeing if I can get into a bigger business, uh, seeing like forensic accounting, uh, trying to sit next to someone, watch what they do, and just kind of get the feel of where I want to be. After and Mark, college. let me ask you this. The, the financing of your education, is it planned out? Yes. Uh, I'm paying for my own college. It's all coming out of like grants and loans. Uh, but my mom and dad aren't helping me with payments. I have to work. I work with my dad in construction to pay for my own college. You're doing that? Yes. I, I just can push a little further. How much more invested are you in your college experience because you are doing this yourself? Uh, by doing it myself, I kind of feel a little bit more with the time management. It's helping me a lot because I go from school to work to soccer practice. And then, you play soccer as well? Yes. So I do that. And then on Fridays, I don't have school. So I, I go to work all day, then soccer practice, Saturdays I work. And I'm just trying to work as much as possible. Now, this way, I can slowly pay off my, my loans. You're all in, aren't you? Yes. Michael, what are you hearing? Uh, it's a, I admire what, what he's doing uh, tremendously, and it, it speaks exactly to what we're trying to get at, that the return on investment is not a dollar sign at the end of the day. What it's, do you mean? I wanted to, to, to hear that this school is helping him get his aspirations and, and reach his goals. Is really but what Mark it's all is about. doing the work. He, he's doing the work, which is great. He's got the resources and sounds like terrific counselors and, and, um, and his own personal motivation, which is what everyone's got to bring to the game. Uh, what, what is frustrating for for, uh, for me and, and folks in our association is, is seeing lists like what you're talking about before where return on investment is simply a dollar sign 10 years out what are typical graduates making and that's from our and that's perspective. that's the criteria that's used. Yeah, well, the I, I, that? I don't think that measures the quality of the education that they get. If someone brings the passion of wanting to work in a particular industry and, and can get there through the school that they pick, that's the sign of success. It's uh, if, if you want to make the most money and it's got more to do with what you do, the major that you pick, rather than the school there, where you go. Um, all the, the, the return on investment lists, invariably, it's engineers who make the most money. Well, that's, we, that, we kind of know that. Uh, if you want to so be an engineer, that that's major, fantastic. Sorry for interrupting. So if you're not in that major, you've done really well. You even find a good job. You're fortunate enough in this tough, these tough times to find a good job. But you're not earning as much as an engineer. Those lists may not say that that school is one of the best schools because you're not an engineer, right. but the fact is engineers are making the most. Michelle, when you heard um, Mark talk about how he, I was looking at you, yeah. is, that's the spirit of an entrepreneur. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's what we see more and more, and educational environments that can embrace that and can empower that is huge, huge. I mean, that's what- Those are real skills. Absolutely, like? absolutely. Well, and, and skill, and, and let's talk about skills, sure. Steve, because that's what it's all about. You know, workforce development is all about skills. So our companies, our businesses, our 20,000 businesses across the state of New Jersey, you know, unfortunately, they're telling us every day that they're not finding the marks in the world. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the students that You're are coming in. making feel very good right now, but go ahead. It's good, it's good. Well, he's got a lot to be proud of. That's right. Um, but, you know, they're telling us that students are coming out, whether it be, you know, two-year, four-year, without the communication skills and the uh, hands-on experience that they need. You know, the technical skills you, you learn by, by it being in the trade. Sure. But those employability skills, the ability to communicate, to write, to comprehend critical thinking, um, to work in a team How about environment. time management? Time management. And finishing a job. Absolutely. When, when he, and when he said, when he's, Mark, when you, when you use the term time management right now, okay, that is huge because we hear that all the time. Showing up to work on time, you think that's a given. No. Um, it's a, it's a cr criticality right now in workforce development that employability skills are lacking. So what we're doing on that is we're trying to play a role of facilitator and coordinator. We're trying to say to our businesses, what are the skills that are lacking, employability and technical? 
We're trying then to go back, bring private sector into the game, go to our two and four year colleges and say, here's what the businesses are telling us is missing right now. They'll even help you come and write the curriculum, okay? so that you can deliver the mm. students and the product that can walk right out and walk into a job. How receptive are you finding, this is interesting, yeah. only because I've taught at a few of the uh, institutions of higher learning in the area of business, and I know that getting a course approved is not easy. Mm -hmm. and let's just say there's a little bit of bureaucracy, fair? A little bit. Fair? Mm -hmm. How receptive have, have you found most institutions of higher learning to the Business and Industry Association coming in and saying, listen, we have some ideas? Um, they're coming along, so I will say more so. Everything is evolutionary. Um, you got to start somewhere, and then you got to keep bringing. You know, what's the value to you on sure. this? And and I think the reason why they're coming along is because they're they're scratching their own heads. When you have a college president, you know, sitting there saying, "Well, what do you what do you mean that my product, my student, uh, isn't what you want or need?" It's a sense of pride as well. They are coming along, and, and it's wonderful. Need. There's a need. What are you hearing? Well. Berkeley has always had a very unique approach to our academic, joining academics and making our students very career focused from the onset. I think it starts from day one because all of our professors not only have their academic credentials to teach, but also have practical work experience in the field in which they're educating our students on. So they're not giving them a strict book education, they're also interjecting in with them what their personal experiences have been from industry and what industry is looking for and industry needs. So it becomes a different perspective where it is a professor, but it is also a mentor. And Someone's I believe, actually been in it? Yes. Because I believe that you're teaching your passion. So that makes it a different classroom environment. And I think you would agree. And, and that's in the accounting field. Are, have you dealt with professors who actually are in the field as well? Uh, I haven't started my accounting classes yet. Oh, because, you're doing the general? Yeah. Right now I'm in my general classes. Uh, I started late, so I didn't really get to choose my accounting class. But I feel like they help you a lot, and they kind of guide you in the right direction. But if you don't do the work yourself, you're not going to succeed what they're trying to get you to do. S stay on what Mark just said. Because, by the way, you've been looking at websites throughout this program about how you can get more information. But ultimately, ultimately, is it fair to say that even though an institution of higher learning can provide lots of resources, lots of information, lots of help, some financial assistance where that is appropriate, ultimately, I often say this, I do a lot of executive coaching and leadership development, and I often say to my clients, you are the quarterback of your own career. Someone said, I didn't get this partnership because so-and-so didn't help me. I didn't get this promotion. You're shaking your head, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, you are the quarterback of your own career. I'm not saying you control everything, but it's, it's, you're the quarterback of your academic experience. Is that mm -hmm. too simplistic? Is that just belong on a bumper sticker and it's not really true? I really believe it, but more importantly, do you believe it? I do. And uh, it, you, students and parents can be overwhelmed with choices. And, and uh, my little brother used to say that you can't trust an 18-year-old. Is, is Mark the quarterback of his academic career? I think so. He's, he's proven it, yeah. No, uh, is, is every student oh, is there... ultimately the person who has the greatest influence over his or her academic career? There's a, an interesting poll that Gallup did with Purdue University that shows that coming out of college, um, looking back on it, graduates say they had their ones that had the most satisfaction and thought, thought they mo got the most out of it, didn't do it alone. They felt like they had to have workplace experience, which is what we're talking about, sure. and can look back and had a mentor. And those two things made them much more satisfied with their college experience, not the, what their grades were, not what their job was. Uh, so those are really key factors. But isn't it the job of the student respectfully, to find that to find mentor. Yeah, right. Listen, if someone reaches out for you and says, I want to be your mentor, that's great. But if you don't have one, don't you have to go find one? I think it depends on, I agree with you. The student is definitely the quarterback, and they, but they also have to be able to have the assertiveness and the comfort level to go out there and pick who they want on their teams. You can be a great quarterback, but if you don't have somebody to throw the ball to, you're not going to score. That's interesting. Uh, Michelle, final thoughts here about the importance of making the bet, not the right choice, because it's not any one choice, the best possible choice about higher ed. Mm -hmm. Well, a few and things. And its impact on your future. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to, you always have to step back. And so it's one thing to be passionate. I mean, passion drives everything, but passion also is just being a self-directed person. Um, be honest about your skills and your abilities. I, I truly believe, we talked about this earlier, I truly believe technical skills you can pick up along the way when you're in the right environment, um, but being self-driven, self motivated, um, and staying focused and sharp, I think that's significantly important. Um, if you bring passion to the game and if you bring motivation and you're self-driven, yeah. you're gonna be successful. The skills are gonna come along. Someone can't teach you that. Um, listen, I wanna thank all of you for joining us and talking about the importance not just of higher education, but making the right choices. And you, I know you were nervous before you came on the program, you are a great role model who motivated a lot of people. You should be proud of yourself, we are. Thank the you. preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Barnabas Health, New Jersey Resources, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Mental Health Association in New Jersey, the Russell Berry Foundation, NJM, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Your health is a precious resource, the foundation for everything you do. So at Barnabas Health, we do all we can to restore, protect, and improve it. Should you need care, we offer world-renowned specialists and amazing technology. Yet we also have hundreds of programs to help you avoid the need for that care in the first place. We're here for your health, so you can live, love, work, play, and dream. Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy.